there's a lot of material here, a lot of depth theologically here. I'm not going to I'm not going to pause at every one. We'll move forward with it, but I'll let you know we could spend several months here. Uh, the things that Jesus is teaching and the way He presents Himself. It started all with the feeding of the five thousand. Fed the five thousand. Then he walked on water. <laughs> and then he comes and they start seeking him. Yeah, they're seeking him, but we saw that it was the wrong motive. Uh, wrong priorities. And they wanted food. They wanted physical. They wanted sensational. And Jesus wasn't about that. And he wasn't going to give that to them. And we come to this pa passage this morning in John chapter 6, verse 30. And Jesus had just told them that in verse 29, this is the work of God that you believe on Him whom He hath sent. Faith, believe, that's, believe in God, trust God. Believe, put your faith in Jesus Christ. That's, the, that's what God wants us to do. And we come to verse 30, And they said therefore unto Him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? At what doest thou work? Isn't that amazing? He just showed, he just fed 5,000. He just, this is what, and he just gave them, telling them who he was. And they just didn't get it. They wanted another sign. They would not believe it. This section that we're going to deal with today, and we're going to have part two next week of the bread of life, this deals with mental assent. That means you agree with the truth. And they wouldn't agree with the truth. They wanted, they wouldn't agree with the truth of who Jesus was. They wanted him to provide for them physically, take care of them. And even the Jewish teachers, uh, rabbis in those days, taught that when Messiah would come, he would provide food for them endlessly. Look at what he says in verse 31. Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, and it is written... He gave them bread from heaven to eat. They, in the synagogue, and they might have even had the passage open in Exodus where God had told Moses that he was going to send the manna. And Jesus had just fed the 5,000. We're talking about manna now. And they're saying, okay, this, feed us. Show us more. We don't want just one meal. We want more meals. And so again, we come back to that question. I mean, how many people really seek the truth about who Christ is? Is He the Son of God? Is He the Savior of the world? And how many people really seek that? I think very few seek it. I think very few will listen. I've done witnessing for 40 years. This August, this coming August, I'll be preaching. I surrendered to preach 40 years ago this August. been preaching... Don't know how many people got saved through that or whatever. I, I used to keep count. And then I just threw the numbers away and said, you know what? God knows. I'm just going to be a faithful messenger and whatever, whoever gets saved gets saved. Whoever comes, comes, whatever. And that was a great relief off me. I always thought about numbers, you know. But for very few listen. But I found out that everybody somewhere along the way has excuses. These people wouldn't listen they wanted something other than who Jesus was. They wanted something that Jesus could provide. Now, we should want salvation. But if we're just seeking the material things, we have the wrong motive. If you look over in verse 20, 41, The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? That's the way it is, isn't it? Everybody has an excuse. Everybody has a blind spot. Satan blinded the minds. We think, these people, they go, he didn't come from heaven. We know him. That's Joseph's son, Nazareth. Nothing good comes out of there. And, and so, we got, if you've done any witnessing at all, you know that. You know what, I would listen to you, but those church people, you know, or I know so-and-so, if they're a Christian, everybody's a Christian. They have those. And I don't care if we lived perfect, spotless lives. They'd still have them. How do I know that? Jesus, the Son of God. He's doing miracles. And they still go, huh, 
That's the son of Joseph. That's what we're dealing with. That's what Jesus was dealing with. People that not only always look to the physical, but they always have that excuse to not listen, to not believe. And they choose not. It's willfulness that they don't believe when the truth presented. We just got to present the truth. We just have to present the truth. And let God do with it what He, what he chooses. And that's what Jesus does. And we get to the end of this chapter, we're going to see every one of them leaving. And he turns to his disciples and says, are y'all going to go away? He was about the truth. Follow me or not. That's up to you. But he went on and, and that's, that should be our... I, that's, I mean, that, that's how my mind developed through the years as a pastor. Is I, I just gave the truth. and You can't beg people into it. They have their excuses. I'll do this or this or that church or you know and, and people and church gives into it you know churches today they take baptists off their churches like that's going to draw that's going to get everybody in the world saved if you take baptists off of it no the name of a church doesn't doesn't affect that that's just people's excuses and we give into that and when we do that it causes us to back off from the truth and he goes, okay, I've got to do something to change this or they tell me they don't like when I preach this way or they tell me I don't li- they don't like this truth. I'm not talking about method. I'm talking about truth. They don't like when you preach it that, this boldly or this plainly. I better back off and make it soft. They still have excuses. And we're going to get into this passage and we're going to see the inability of man and the willfulness of man to continue to live on in their sin. And so Jesus says unto them, verse 32, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven. Moses didn't give it to you. He was just the messenger. God gave it to you. They didn't even know their Bibles. (laughs) That's something I found out as I've witnessed around, you know, if you knock on doors. and, And I haven't done that much of it here, actually, but in Salt Lake and in every other place. But, uh, you find out how many theologians there are. There's a lot of theologians out there. I mean, they come, with, they come at you, what do you think about this verse? And you tell them the correct interpretation of it, and they go, well, I think it's this. And next thing you know, you're, where'd you, where did you go to college at? Where did you go to seminary? They didn't go anywhere. They listened to somebody on the TV that got off track, and they're following that, and it's deceiving them. And so Jesus is saying to them, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven. Moses didn't do that. I mean, this scene is almost to go back to Exodus. I mean, you got the Jews and you got Jesus here and you got Moses back then, and then they're murmuring against Jesus, they're murmuring against Moses. But my father, Jesus said, giveth you the true bread from heaven. Genuine, real. God gave you manna that kept you sustained for during the day for 40 years. Then it went away. We're going to see later the permanence of this bread that Jesus, who Jesus is. Verse 33, the bread, for the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Giveth life unto the world. This bread wasn't just for Israel. It was for the world. And so these Jews are standing there listening. What in the world? Joseph's son? True bread? You're like manna? Moses didn't give us the bread? Jesus called them out. They didn't know their Bible. And then we start in verse 34. And they say this. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. See, they want it every day. Physical bread. Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. Unbelievable. These people probably just, I mean, I mean, they probably went, oh, I could just imagine how they acted. When they, oh, I mean, you know, the response. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I say unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. There it is. People say, if I see, I'll believe. No, you won't. Remember the rich man in hell was told, if they won't believe Moses and the prophets, how will they believe those one rose from the dead? So all these excuses that 
that these people have, if I can see it, I'll believe. No, you won't. You won't believe if you see. And then he comes to verse 37, and, and, he, and he starts. <laughs> the rest of the passage is just one after another, theological depth and truth that we're not just going to dive in head first on. We're going to cover it, but not spend it all on one verse. But look at verse 37. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. So I want us to think, if, you, if, you, if you're taking mental notes or any kind of notes, the first thing is, we have, we have to believe Jesus is who he said he was. Just take, think about that statement. We have to believe who Jesus said he was. And so Jesus comes and tells the people, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me, that means I believe you are who you say you are, because he says, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. So the coming and the believing. You've got to believe Jesus said who he was. It's not about what Jesus gives other than salvation. It's about who He is. He's the Son of God. He's the sinless Son of God. He's the one who went, He's going to go to the cross to these people. He hasn't gone to the cross yet. We know He has. But He hasn't gone to the cross yet. But He's going to go to the cross. He's going to die for their sins. And they've got to believe that. And so He says, you come to Me, then I'll, 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 we'll, you'll never hunger. You'll never Thirst. What is he talking about? Hunger. I, I get hungry all the time, don't you? I mean, if I don't eat after church, I'm going to be famished. <laughs> and I'm a Christian. I know him. No, he's talking about true hunger. The true hunger that every person has, but they might not be able to put their finger on it, a lost person, but they have a spiritual hunger, a spiritual desire. They're starving to death for Jesus Christ, and they don't know it. That's really so important for us that we present the truth. And that's all we can do. We can't twist arms. We can't get fancy and try to, you know, trick them into doing it. That's just not the way it works. We don't, people aren't satisfied that way. But when we find Jesus Christ as our Savior and we come to Him, that means we give and we believe in Him. So I've got to believe who Jesus is. Faith. Now we go down. Verse 37. And here we have, I mean, just think about this. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will no wise cast out. That verse basically says the Father gives sovereignty. We come, human responsibility, and Jesus keeps I mean, that's a powerful verse right there. I mean, it comes together and the tension builds at this verse. And we ask this question. As I, as I look at this verse, I want to ask this question. Does God choose me? Or do I choose God? And my answer is, yes. <laughs> yes. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tension that we can't, in our finite minds, put together. Divine sovereignty, the ones who the Father gives me, and human responsibility who come to me, can't put it together. Where does it fit? Some people go to the one line and go, there is no way that God... There's no way that God is sovereign over salvation. It's all up to men. It's all up to us whether we get saved or not. It's all up to us. You really, it's, you, can't, you can't find that in Scripture. Let me give you some verses. Now we know, I'm all about the whosoever will. Trust me. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish. John, Romans 10, 13. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm, I, 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 I'm all about it. I think we ought to go and tell people, and it's, and it's our responsibility to come to Christ. <laughs> and if I choose not to, okay. I choose not to. If I choose to, okay, I choose to. But there's other verses. And I'm not going to answer this question today. I used to sit around and think about this a lot. And, and it, it about drove me crazy because there's no way you can get your head around it. I heard the best, ex, best explanations, I think, from both sides. And then I heard the best explanation I've ever heard 
is it's both of them in the Bible. Just live with it. <laughs> That's the best explanation I've learned. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, listen to this. According as He has chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be, blame, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. At Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Am I trying to prove predestination or something? I absolutely am not. I'm not. But there is election in the Bible. In Romans chapter 8, look at verse 28. We know this verse. We know all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose, for whom He did foreknow. So He, know, he foreknows. God knows everything. So He knows who's going to get saved and who's not. Now, I'm not going to get into that decreeing in different things. I'm just not going to. It's just God foreknew. However He foreknows. I, I started a message I preached at, and I, I'm on Romans and I go, listen guys, I don't know everything about this but this is one thing I do know. God knows who's going to get saved and who doesn't. I know that. How He knows it, I don't know. That's not for me to figure out. God gives us the answers, we guide them. If He doesn't give us the answer, we go with it. And so what he does, he foreknows. Then what does he do? Predestination has to do with after salvation. Then he predestines them to be conformed to the image of his son. So we take out that word because that's a word that's used after. Then you've got election. We can't put it together. And I'm not going to act like I'm a genius and try. I think that one really, not being funny like I was a while ago, but the best explanation I heard of it was Warren Wiersbe. He said, I, can't, I don't know how to tell you which way it goes. They're both in the Bible. They're both equal. Sovereignty of God, responsibility of man. He said, I, I think of it like this. He said, when I get to heaven, let's just pretend there's a door. Over the door it says, whosoever will. And he goes, I walk in. And he says, but I'll turn around and look on the side elect from the foundation of the world. That makes sense to me. We don't know. So we tell everybody. We don't play with it. We don't, we don't, we don't, I, I got to where I used to argue about it. I don't argue about it anymore. Somebody comes at me, I go, okay, do that, fine. But it's there. I mean, they're there. So you can't do anything with it. So Jesus right here, he puts it down to them and says, all that the Father giveth to me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me, so we've got to do it. We've got to put our faith in Christ. And that's, that's what we have to do. We can't get around that. We can't stop evangelizing and go, well, whoever's going to be saved is going to be saved. That's not the way God set it up. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And then he says he commands every, all men everywhere to repent in Acts. He's commanding them to repent. So we do that. We're obedient. And so... God, his, Jesus comes here and he says, this is what's happening. You've got to believe who I am. You've got to believe who Jesus is, the Son of God, the bread of life, the Savior of the world, all, the, all those things about him, who he is. That's the only way we'll come to him, the way he's talking about here. He's talking to these Jews and saying, the Father gives me, they come to me. Well, the Father reveals, remember when uh, the great confession of Peter. Jesus was asking him, said, Who do men say that I, am? I the Son of Man, am? And then Elias, Jeremiah, some of the prophets. And Jesus said, Who do you say that I am? And that's when Peter made that great confession. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. What did Jesus say to him? Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. God reveals to us who Jesus is. Then we come. That's, that's the way of salvation. It's not that I got in trouble this week and I come forward and God get me out of this trouble. I got saved today. No, no, no. You didn't come to Him for bread, a physical bread. You came to Him for spiritual bread. Something that would change your soul and change your heart. And so we've got to believe who He is or we can't come to Him in a biblical sense for salvation. But once we do that, look at what Jesus says next in verse 38. For I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of Him that sent me. Excuse me. 
but the will of Him yeah, that sent me. So Jesus has come to do the Father's will. What is the Father's will? And this is the Father's will, verse 39. He tells us. This is what His will is. That of all them which He hath given me, I should lose nothing. So none will be lost that truly come to Him, given to Him by the Father. It's like a dad giving a bride to his son. Here, son. But should raise him up at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I'll raise him up at the last day. He said three things there. He came to do the will. What was the Father's will? None would be lost. Everlasting life. Resurrection. Three things. Jesus was on mission. Jesus was on purpose. He came to this earth, not primarily to meet our physical needs. I mean, that stuff happened. He healed blind. He made the lame walk. He fed the 5,000. He did those things to show that He was who He said He was. But His purpose in coming to this world, He said, I come to do Thy will, O God. What was it? To seek and to save that which was lost. Not only to seek and save that which was lost, but to give them everlasting life. And that's not something we wait on. Once we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, we have eternal life. We have it. It's not we're waiting someday for it. No, we have it now. Spiritually, we'll live forever in heaven with the Father. I mean, He's laying it on these Jews, man. And and, I mean, it just, where did that come from? They're probably sitting there and their minds are being blown. And resurrection? And we're going to be resurrected? This is amazing. You know what he's teaching them here? He says, not only those who come to me and believe in me and believe that who I am, but those that come to me are eternally, from this day forward, secure. These are the greatest verses on security of the believer. We're going to, once we get saved, we're always saved. You know, there's people out there that go, well, I don't know if you get saved, you're saved. Or, I don't know. You can't go out here and live any way you want to and, and, uh, and think that, uh, you're going to go to heaven. We're sinners saved by grace. I can't judge anybody's salvation. And a lot of times, our judging of salvation has caused a lot of people a false hope in salvation. You know? I mean, when I, was, when I, when I was first started going to church, I had, a great, I had a great pastor. But, I mean, he was hard on everything. Hard. I mean, and basically against everything. <laughs> and... I mean, I loved him. I mean, he just passed away two weeks ago. And um, I loved him. He had an impact on my life. I surrendered to preach under his ministry. And, and, uh, and, and, and he set the course for me in my, in my preaching. There's no doubt about it. Um, but I, I picked up where he left off, you know, when I went out. And I started doing the same things. And, and as I grew in the ministry, and maybe I didn't, maybe I backslid. You know, some people say, well, you backslid. Do you think anything's okay? No. I just give quick give people a false hope in heaven, of heaven, by saying, "Hey, man, if if you don't do this, there's no way you can be saved." Or you know, if you don't do this, there's no way you can be saved. I quit saying that because I don't know. I mean, I've put so much emphasis on serving in the church that I think I don't know how much people served outside of church. And you think about it. What is serving the Lord? Serving the Lord is 24-7, seven days a week. We come to church for fellowship, to use our gifts, and to worship together as a body. Three, at best, three hours a week, four hours maybe. What's the other 164 hours? We don't serve anymore? You see that? And I mean, I got caught up into that. And so the world has, and then the world shames us into those things. Well, if, but listen. Once we come to Christ, we believe who He said He was. The the Son of God, the Christ, the Son of the living God, Savior of the world, the Messiah. And I put my faith in Him. I am eternally secure. When He said here, this is what the Father's will is, that all that He hath given me, I should lose nothing. I will lose nothing. But should raise him up at the last day. I'm going to be resurrected. That is guaranteed. If I trust Christ. 
and I'll have, I have everlasting life. It's a present thing. We know that. We receive Jesus Christ as our Savior. First John says, He that believeth the Son hath life. He that believeth not hath not life. So if I believe in the Son and I, I believe who He is, then I have the life of God in me. So I'm eternal. And you are too if you know Jesus as your Savior. You say, preacher, this, listen, I can't imagine what these Jews were thinking. I mean, this is some deep stuff. And, and they're sitting there going, Resur you're going to secure resurrection for us. You're going to secure everlasting life for us. You'll never let us go. Yeah, that's what he came to do. And we can rest secured in that today. Now, if I had to work for my salvation, I can't be secure in that. Because that means when I quit working, I lose it. And there's some people that go to that extreme. But let's read some verses. I like these verses. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. As we think about this, I mean, we could spend a lot of time, and we're going to spend more time on it when we come to John chapter 10, and when we come to John chapter 17, we'll talk more about eternal security. But we just deal with this passage, where we are, and we'll go through this. In uh, Philippians chapter 1, listen to the way Paul writes in verse 6. He says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. When I received Jesus Christ as my Savior, God starts. God changed me. I became a new creature. Old things became. Old things passed away. All things became new. And He even started working on me. And, I, and we call that sanctification. And He says He's going to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ, guaranteed. But I think my favorite one is this. And there's others. And like I said, I'll deal with other verses when we get into these other passages. But turn to First Peter. First Peter chapter one. I don't know how many times in my own life that I've turned to this verse and just believed it. I just go, God, I'm going to believe it. I, I've done everything I know how to do to receive Christ as my Savior. And if, 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 if it depends on me, I can't, I can't keep it. But look what he says in verse, beginning in verse 4, 1 Peter chapter 1. To an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Listen to this. Who are kept, how? By the power of God. Through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Kept by the power of God. I'm kept by the power of God. That doesn't mean, I've heard people say, you know, you know, in John Chen, he'll say, you're in my hand, no man can pluck you out of my hand. I've heard people say, well, nobody can pluck you out, but you can walk away. <laughs> no. I'm kept by the power of God. And the thing about it is, if I'm saved, I don't want to get away. I'm not going to fight God and get me out of your hand. I want to spend an eternity in hell. A, a saved person is not going to do that. Now, if they're lost, they're not in his hand anyway. So they'll go away eventually unless they get saved. But we are secure for eternity. And so when I look at this, I go, well, if I put my faith, if I believe that Jesus is who he said he was, and that's what we have to get down to, he that cometh me must believe. Okay, I believe that Jesus is the Son. If I believe that, if I put my faith in Christ, then I'm eternally secure. And that security, just like my salvation, does not depend on me. I didn't die for myself on the cross. Jesus did. So my salvation is based on what he did on the cross. My security is based on his power to keep me. Nothing that I do can change that. I mean, it's just like I have children. I don't care what they go out and do. They're still my child. <laughs> Can't change that. They might go, I, I don't want to be known as your son anymore. Okay, it doesn't matter. You still are. You know, but nobody's going to do that. Nobody's going to look at God and go, God, I really don't want to be a child of yours. And if they've ever been a child, they're not going to say that because they want to be. It's in us, and we're secure. And Jesus is teaching them. He said, I'm the bread of life. This is what I bring to you. I bring satisfaction. I meet your deepest longing of a relationship with God and security. Security. It doesn't matter what happens next. I'm secure. 
It doesn't matter what happens in 2021. I'm a child of the God. He's going to keep me. It doesn't matter how things turn out in our country. I'm part of another kingdom. I'm, I have a father that, that I'm listening to, that I'm following, that's going to keep me regardless. I mean, Paul in Romans chapter 8, when he said, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Let me read that verse to you. In the end of Romans chapter, I say, yeah, 8. He says in verse 38, Notice beginning in verse 37, he says, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So if you take all those things, Paul says, nothing no demon, no sickness, no kingdoms, no things present, no things to come. Nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm a conqueror. <laughs> if I'm secure in that, then we can be conquerors. And we should meditate on these verses. I mean, these are, these are powerful, life-changing verses. I mean, I love studying this and I had to just sit and think forever of what to leave out and what to put in and knowing that other things are coming and I can add there when we get there about eternal security. But these Jews are, Jesus is saying, I'm the bread. I'm the true bread that came from God that's going to meet these true hungers, true hunger in your life of salvation, a right relationship with God, and of security. I'm secure. But to look at verse 41. I mean, he says these things. This is who I am. Verse 41, he says, And Jesus, then the Jews murmured at him. Because he said, I'm the bread which came down from heaven. There you go. There's always somebody. Oh, I got you right there. Really. You know what? It used to. I, it would burn me up when I would be out witnessing and somebody would do stuff like that. And as I went on with it, I got to where, okay, I'm going on. You know, just... Go on. I'm not going to argue with you. I'm not going to fight. This is who he is. This is what he does spiritually for us. But the Jews, they murmured, just like the forefathers in Exodus. They wandered around the wilderness for 40 years because they murmured. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? I just don't get that. I just don't get that. If they'd even got, if they'd even, if they could have even the least bit could have understood this, he just sat there and promised you everlasting life. He just sat there, he just stood there and promised you that when you die, you're going to be resurrected. Leave, leave that up to him. How, how is this bread coming from heaven? I want to know more about you. There. They're murmuring. Jesus answered them, verse 43, and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. Here's another, I mean, just stop dead in your tracks statement. He makes a lot of these in this passage. Verse 44, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. We looked at, I got to believe him. As a son of at who he is. I'm secure if I believe that. I'm secure for all eternity. And now these, these, these Jews are standing around murmuring, complaining. Is How can we make him our bread? How can he do this? You're Joseph's son. And Jesus said, wait a minute. You're missing a point here. You can't figure it out. You can't do anything to get it. No man. No. Nobody can come to the Father except which hath sent me draw him. I, I think we're going to see in the next verses the inability of man to come to Christ on his own. The inability of man to come to Christ on his own. Unless the Father draws, you will not come. Oh, you might come to an altar. You might, but how does, let's, let's look at it now. He says, and I will raise him up at the last day if he comes. Listen, verse 45. It's written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father 
cometh unto me. He's saying, what is this drawing? And he tells us right there, they will be taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. It's just like I'm sitting here teaching today, the Word of God. It's not my teaching. We're reading, this, we're reading these verses, trying our best in our minds to, to bring it down to where I can understand it. You probably grasp it easier than me, but this is some really, this is tough stuff. And the Father's teaching us. And somebody might be sitting here or somebody might be listening. And they go, Thou art the Christ, the Son of God. They were just drawn. They got up on a normal Sunday morning, turned on YouTube or live stream or came to church and they're sitting in church and all of a sudden, God starts teaching them. And they go, Christ, the Son of the living God. Just as He taught Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. You see how spiritual all this stuff is. Many times we think it's our technique. It's think, we think it's something we do. No, all, we, all I can do and all you can do is witness. All we can do is tell the truth and say, this is who Jesus is. You've got to believe who He is. That's when the Father begins to draw. And if we haven't been drawn, we come in vain. No man cometh unto me unless the Father draw him. That's as clear as it can be. Even so, he says, whosoever will can come. There it is. But we sit there and go, Fah, I don't want to, I'm not coming. I'm not coming. What was it, Billy Graham? They asked him one time, how many people do you really think get saved out of all these professions that are made? Billy Graham says, I pray 10% of them are. 10%. And maybe, who knows, who can put a number on it? We don't know. But there's herd mentality. If one comes forward, then everybody else is going to come forward. You go to church, that's what you're supposed to do is go forward at the end of a service. So now a lot of churches are cutting out invitations. I wouldn't do that, but they do. Unless the Father draws. I mean, I, literally, when I, when, when I, these truths that I'm just teaching this morning, I mean, when I first started learning these, I went back on my knees, I got back on my knees and I go, God, was I coerced into this? <laughs> Did somebody talk me into it? Did somebody spend two or three hours trying to, to, to convince me to get saved? Or was I truly, did I... Did I really recognize, would I be able to do like Peter did and say, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God? Or did I just make some flippant emotional decision at the end of a church service? I didn't get saved at the end of a church service, but I got saved in a home of a soul winner. But I examined that. And that's what the Word of God does for us. It causes us to go, now wait a minute, you better pin this down. It had nothing to do with you. It was faith in the Son of God. It was the Father that drew. It was the Father that brought conviction. It was but the Holy Spirit. The Father through the Holy Spirit brought conviction. And you could say with Peter, I don't know all the theological terms, but thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. When I saw my inability to get saved or my inability to plan it, I think I mentioned this last week, we don't wake up one Sunday morning and go, I'm going to church to get saved today. Probably not. Because if the Father had been drawing you got saved, you'd, you would have started doing it then. Where are we in that? What are we counting on for our salvation? When I talk about, remember I started out, I said mental ascent is the first step in salvation. These Jews had to believe these things. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Or He said, the bread of life. I cannot go to Him unless the Father draws me and open my eyes and let me see who Christ is. Christ said, you see me as a person, but you believe not. That's scary stuff to me. And so believe me, when I first started learning this, I was in college. And I go, I mean, I, knots, days, I'm going, God, I've got to know this. 
did I come up with some whatever to get saved or was it you that did it? And assurance came, no doubt. And then you read stories about revivals where people come and, and they beg God. God, save me. God, I can't do it myself. And it wasn't a lot of times just something easy. And Peter put it on these guys. And he says, listen, unless you believe who I am, and you won't unless the Father draws you, you'll not get the spiritual significance. Hey, there's a lot of people out here, even the devils believe and tremble. The devil knows who Jesus Christ is. Demons know who he is. They know who he's the Son of God. As God wakened our heart, and I go, you know, I don't know. That's not a bad thing. I don't think we ought to doubt our salvation at all. But I need to revisit. I revisited mine when I learned these truths. And I think they're there for that. If we don't have it, then, it, the, then the, go, the, Lord wait, the Lord will start speaking to us. If we do have it, then I'm going to go, Lord, I'm going to go check this out. This is not something I want to base. I don't want to risk my eternity on a one-time something that I might have did on my own out of an emotional whatever. I want the reality of this salvation. I want the real thing, the true bread from heaven. Not just the manna that's going to decay in this life, but the true bread that is raises me up on that last day and has it given me everlasting life. That's what I'm seeking. God draws. And when God starts drawing, men become willing. They might get away for a while. I remember the first time God spoke to me about it. I was in a church, Baptist church, and, and uh, man, the preacher preached. That's all there was to it. That old-timey preaching, you know. Not none of this pretty boy stuff today. It was old-timey stuff. I mean, it lit me up. Boy, I sat there, and I mean, I said, I'll leave and I'll never go to church again. I've, I mean, I, and, I, and I didn't. I didn't go back to church <laughs> I had to be at a friend's house one night and get one to the Lord by a soul winner. Because I wasn't going... Why did I... Was I hate God? No, it scared the life out of me. God started drawing. And He drew. He kept drawing. He could have quit any time, but He kept drawing me for two years. Until finally my heart was willing. Divine sovereignty, human responsibility came together. In June of 1977. And I received Jesus Christ as my Savior. And then when I learned these truths, I visited that again. You know, I go, Lord, what was it? Was it me? Was it something else? Or was it the reality that you had revealed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God to me? And that I was a sinner and I would spend eternity in hell without Christ. And it gave me the assurance. It was. It was real. I hope you have the same, same assurance. That we can look at this and, and say, there's, I, there's, I, have, I am not able to go to God unless He draws me. Unless He draws me. i got to believe that. This is the first part of it. A mental ascent. Next week we'll talk about appropriation. But do I believe that? then people would be crying out thinking, hey, I'm not going to wait till the rapture and then get saved. Or I'm not going to wait till I'm 80 years old and I'm on the deathbed and then I'll get saved. I'm not going to wait till I get my children out of home and then I'll get saved. No, we start getting concerned about it right now. And that concern is the Father drawing. And we get on our knees and we start crying out to God, I can't get saved unless you do it. Show me Christ. I don't want to be like the Jews that I see, but I don't believe. Because we've become so familiar with it. I see, but I don't believe. I hope every person knows Jesus Christ as their Savior this morning. It's, a, it's, it's an eternal reality. It's, 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 it's more important than anything that could be going on in, in, in America in 2021. 
It's more important than any vaccine. It's more important than any new discovery. Where will I spend eternity? Will I be raised on the last day and take everlasting life? Or will not? Because I trusted in somebody else. I trusted in my faith. I had faith in faith. I didn't have faith in Christ. I had faith in a prayer. I didn't have faith in Christ. I had faith because I went to church. I, went, I had faith because I gave in church. I had faith because I did this. No, no, no. When it comes to our salvation, it has to be, we have to believe He was who He said He was. That's where we start. And if we can't believe that and submit to that and come to that, there's no eternal security. There's no way that we can get there on our own. We're in, unable to do it. The Father has to draw. So I go to the Father and say, God, draw me. Draw me, God. I hope everyone's been saved. Let's pray. Father, thank you today for your goodness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for the Word of God. These verses, God, they're they're just so much that, Lord, we just can't grasp it all. But I pray the Holy Spirit take what I said. Give us a spiritual hunger a spiritual hunger to begin with for salvation, for the saving of our soul. And secondly, a spiritual hunger for you. Do we feed off that manna, that you are the bread of life, that we feed off you daily, that we seek to draw closer to you, that we seek to know more about you. God, give us spiritual hunger. Father, help us. Bless in the next hour. I pray you bless the pastor. Anoint him, Lord. Give us the words that we need to hear. In Jesus' name, amen.